Hello to everyone who is following today's lecture on our lectures, online lecture series, mobility analysis and planning for human scale cities. This is the eighth lecture in the series. Previous lectures are available as recordings on the lecture series website, transportplanning.ut.ee. Today, we are very happy to welcome in Zoom, Professor Frank Whitlock. Frank is senior full professor of economic geography and head of the department of geography at Kent University and also visiting professor at the Department of Geography, University of Tartu. His research focuses mainly on travel behavior analysis and modeling. Frank's, lec Frank's lecture today is about modeling approaches in transport geography. If you have questions during the lecture, please post them on chat. We will have a questions and answers session in the end of the lecture. Welcome, Frank. The screen is yours now. Okay, so um, thanks for the invitation and thanks uh, Arga and Siri for organizing this lecture series. So in um, preparation of this lecture, I had also a bit of a look at what was previously said. And although that the lectures in Estonian are a bit uh, tricky for me, but I saw that at least there is a, a strong link to uh, transport, transport planning and mobility. So I'm happy to share with you my thoughts on how you could model this process. I'm going to share my screen. And in that sense, it should be, uh, let's see, this one. So I take it that you are seeing the screen now? Yes, okay. So in a sense, what we're wanting to discuss today is a bit a kind of an overview of the different approaches in transport geography or urban mobility research in relation to, to modeling and modeling approaches. Now, this is a part of a, a bigger course that I teach um, at Ghent, spatial analysis course, and obviously it's a bit difficult in a one hour session to, to cover all of the topics. So we'll, we'll briefly, let's say, mention the, the different approaches and what is, um, what is relevant for this, but obviously more in-depth analysis or questions uh, can always be uh, answered <coughs> uh, or asked in the, uh, in, in the end of the session or at, um, at another time. Maybe start with something obvious, and um, that is that in a sense, if you uh, look at what are the two elements that are relevant when you are dealing with a, um, a transport or a modeling problem, is that you want to gain insight. And that's the key, the key issue. And in order to gain insight, well, what you see is you need to have data, suitable data, and we can have a, an, an entire discussion on different types of data and the advantages and disadvantages of using data. But if the, uh, the data is great, then that's already a good start. But then the next question is, what type of model will you apply to the data? And if you see that if the model is a bit like a garbage model, then probably the results or the results will be garbage as well. And in the end, you make, um, you make poor decisions. So it's not only about having great data, but it's also about having great models. And obviously with models, we mean different type of modeling approaches that fit the data and that also fit with the theory of what we think uh, uh, handles or at least influences how we behave in terms of our travel behavior and activity participation. So Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted now, I think. Yeah, okay. So the, the basic idea is obviously to get insights. And in order to do that, we need great data, great modeling approaches, and also great results. Uh, I would like to start with, an, with a, a rather um, interesting quote, uh, two quotes, actually. The first one says that, um, in, in essence, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. 
And that's already a statement meaning that, well, a model is by, by definition a simplification of the reality. So in that sense, all models are wrong. So you need to choose that model that is, let's say, less wrong or that fit, best fits your particular approach. So some of them are indeed useful. And a second quote is, I think, even more interesting, says that if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to almost anything, which actually means that in most of the cases, if we apply a model, then we do some analysis and we see the results and we look for what is referred to as phase validity. Do the results, do they more or less coincide with what we think intuitively, what would be the overall results? So if you assume that, for instance, if somebody gets more income, and as a result of that, that person will travel less, then maybe this is something that we would not expect because higher levels of income would maybe imply that we have more uh, availability, more possibilities to travel. So in a sense, it's meaning, it means that if we apply a model, we usually apply one or several and we run different models. And then in the end, hopefully we, we choose that model that best uh, fits the phase validity of our particular problem. Now, if we have a big um, distinction between two different approaches in terms of transport modeling, then we can say a lot depends upon, are we interested in modeling flows streams of information of people, of migrants, of money, of goods, of freight, of tourists. tourists. So then we are looking at so-called aggregated approaches. So in an aggregated approach, we just put everything together. And then the, um, the key model here used and developed in the 1960s and 70s is the so-called four stage or four step model. And we will discuss that um, in a bit more detail in a moment. But obviously if we aggregate things, we also lose information. We lose information in terms of individual information, in terms of temporal information, and also in terms of spatial information because we're looking at just at aggregated flows. So therefore in the 1980s and 90s, and also due to new possibilities in terms of computing and GIS ap applications, well, the, uh, the transport modeling world turned its attention to so-called disaggregated approaches, approaches where we analyze the travel behavior of individuals. And that could also be an individual planning a trip, an individual planning a tour, which means a kind of consecutive number of trips, which then is defined as a tour, or we could also take it a bit broader and not only analyze travel behavior, but look at the activity patterns at the activity behavior of a, of a person. If I'm sleeping, I'm not traveling. If I'm traveling, then probably I'm not working. So in terms of the activities that I do, I can somehow also try to understand what is the relation of an activity in terms of, for instance, the, uh, the transport that is linked to it. So the different approaches also imply different data requirements. And as I said, in the 1960s, it was mainly questions that were raised to engineers, traffic engineers, where the politicians said like, um, well, do we need this bridge? Uh, are we going to build this bridge? And then obviously the politicians, they want a clear answer, a simple yes or no. Now, you could simply say that uh, if the politician would ask, do we need this bridge or this additional road or this tunnel, and then the engineer would just say, well, maybe yes. Then you can understand that this is not um, solid uh, research and science. So you need to somehow develop a kind of a strategy that will much more underline your uh, decision in terms of the yes or the no. And in that sense, the engineers, they came up with this uh, four-step approach, which relates to trip generation, trip distribution, modal choice, and then the route choice or the destination choice. So again, we're looking at flows. We want to analyze whether a certain infrastructure, whether we need additional infrastructure, or also if we take away like infrastructure, what would be the implication of this?
but then look to, at the global network, at the global street network, if we add or if we remove, for instance, infrastructure. And then, as I said, mid 1990s, more and more questions were not like, do we need to, do we need to bridge yes or no? But we want to know how many people will use this bridge if we build them. So we want to have more information, not only on the aggregate flows, but also on, well, which people will use it? Will, be, will it be like local citizens? Will it be maybe tourists? Will it be other types of people in terms of the tours and the trips that they make? And then even further, we see that there is quite a lot of literature on that the travel, obviously, it stems from activities that people want to undertake. Because these activities and because the participation in these activities is always at separate spatial entities, it means that if we want to go to work, then it means it goes from home to work. And in that sense, we have an activity and that activity also uh, implies a, a travel behavior. So in that sense, if the question is not, do we need the bridge, yes or no? The question is, when people go to work, will they then actually also use this newly built bridge? So you see the questions become more and more complex and more and more detailed. And as a result of that, it also means that we need to ask different questions and also look at it from a different approach. So these two different approaches, that's let's say on the plan for today, and we will start with the, uh, the so-called four-step uh, modeling approach. Now, I once had a PhD student at a conference and he started with saying that there are four steps in the four-step model, which is obviously correct. And then the first step, he more or less got a kind of a blackout and he didn't know what the first step was. And then somebody in the room said, trip generation, and then all of a sudden it came back to him. But if you look at this, then you see that depending on what type of approach that you take, that in a sense, you could say that there are actually five steps in the four step model. And the first step, step number zero, that is maybe the most crucial one. And that's defining the area that you want to study. And this Study area definition also means that you want to go and look at from where to where, from origin to destination, from where to where do people travel. And we will come back to that because it's a very important first step, because if you want to do changes to the area that you study, then you have to do the re, then you have to redo the entire model from scratch again. So you could say, in a sense, there are five steps in the four-step model approach, where step zero is defining the research area and how you should do this. And then we see the trip generation, how many trips depart from an area and how many trips arrive in an area, the distribution, from which area to which area are trips being made, with what kind of mode is this travel being done, so that's the modal choice, and then obviously, which route will you eventually choose? So in a sense, if we look at this, it also very much coincides with the way that travel and transport and traffic markets, how they function. So in transport geography, we do not have like one single market, but we actually have three different markets. The first market is the so-called travel market. It's a market where people individually are deciding whether they want to make a trip, yes or no. So it means that they want to carry out certain activities. They will do this in time and space. And as a result of that, they will create, let's say, their own travel market, and that will lead to travel patterns. So here you could say the most important discussions are in terms of volume, in terms of the travel need, and the destination choice. And if we go from the travel market, we go to the transport market. And the transport market is supply and demand. The demand are the travel patterns of everybody. And the supply are the travel modes and the services. So what is on offer? And that will obviously lead to transport patterns. And if we take a closer look in this particular respect, then we see we're dealing with the modal split, what type of modes will you use? 
also in terms of the travel efficiency and the level of technology that will help us to link supply and demand. And finally, if we have these transport patterns, we also have the infrastructure, the roads, the canals, the bridges, whatever, the urban fabric, and that will eventually lead to traffic flow patterns. So in that sense, we're looking at a traffic market, and that has to do with route choice and also the traffic efficiency, and as I said, the design of the urban fabric. So all of this travel, transport, and traffic, they will then finally lead to, well, what will be the benefit of me, somebody moving through and making a decision to move, take use of what is on offer, and then actually create a kind of a traffic flow that will lead in a certain benefit. Usually travel is being regarded as a disutility, but well, participating in activities is being considered as a, uh, as a utility, but it also comes at a certain cost the cost of uh, simply the, uh, the fare, but also uh, internal costs and also potential external costs. Now, if we look at these three different markets, then we see that the four-step model clearly fits with these different types of markets. Because in a sense, the first step would mean what are the zones that we take for departure and origin? And in a sense, it, re it relates to just uh, putting together a kind of an origin and destination matrix. The origin O, which is often referred to as the production, where a trip is being produced, and the destination D, which means the zone where the, uh, the trip will end. And that says something about how attractive a certain zone is. So in a sense, what we want to do with these four-step models, that is, well, trying to fill in and complete this type of matrix where we have origins and destinations. So we can look at this at the level of, let's say, the rows and the columns. These are the total trips that are being made. This is TIJ. And then obviously we need to know if we fill in the matrix, that's the distribution. And if we look at each individual flow with a bit more detail, then that will tell us something about the, uh, the modal split and also the route being chosen. Now, remember, I started with saying that the first most important step is actually the definition of the zones. And there you could have, well, what is usually the case, either wards or neighborhoods, but it could also be at a higher aggregated level, provinces or cities. Uh, or in most of the cases, if you're dealing with transport, the so-called uh, TAS or traffic analysis zones. This is, for instance, the, uh, the traffic analysis zones for Flanders, the region where I live. Uh, and as you see in total, there are about 6,650 of these zones. So that means that our matrix is quite big in terms of rows and columns because the matrix then wants to fill each of these different cells of the matrix. So you have 6,651 columns and rows, and then you want to know what is the flow between each of these different cells. Now you can imagine if we look at, for instance, and I'm not sure whether you're able to see when I move the cursor on the map, whether you can see this, okay, that's great. So if I want to know how many people, for instance, travel from Antwerp to Ghent, then probably this is a distance of about 60 kilometers. And you could say that there is a, a bit of a distance decay that will have an impact on this. And probably there will be more people traveling in the neighborhood of Antwerp than for, in, than for instance from Antwerp going to, let's say, Hasselt or Ging or near the seaside. But all of these different zones, they need to be obviously looked at. And as you can imagine, probably there will be a lot of zeros in the matrix because there will be no flows, for instance, from this zone here to the adjacent zone, zone, there will be probably some people that will travel there or visit a relative or friends, but from this particular zone, maybe to this one, just uh, any zone, whatever, then you probably will know that that will result in a, a flow of, of zero. 
So you have a big matrix with a lot of cells, but also a big matrix with a lot of zeros. Now, if we take the four-step model and the first most important part of this is that you need to know what are the total trips being made in the system. And with system, I mean, well, the zones that you have defined, that you have defined. So if we take again Flanders, then we need to know what are the total trips that are being made in this entire, in this entire area here of Flanders. So the key element is finding this TIJ. If you do not have TIJ, if you don't know the total trips that are being made in the system, then the four-step model will not work. So that's, let's say, the key element here to know and to find what are the total trips being made in the system. Now, in a sense, what it means if I have like five different zones, so instead of having the 6,600 in Flanders, just for illustration, I just have five, then I need to fill in this matrix. And the key element here is that I need to know how many of the total trips are being made in this particular system. I can do this from the point of view as looking at the system as a whole. For instance, we know by means of census data or by means of some kind of a sample or whatever that an aggregate amount of trips could be like this particular case. It could be like 215, could be 215,000. It doesn't matter what the number is. So we have 215 trips being made in this particular system. Now, as I said, if you don't have this number, then it does not work. But maybe you have this at the level of how many people from zone one are going to other zones. In that sense, if we have the total numbers starting from the origin, and if we add all these, then again, we have the total number of trips. Or I could do this the other way around. And then we look at what are the total number of flows that are arriving in a certain zone. So in this particular case, we see 70 people or 70,000 flows or whatever. They arrive in one and they come from zone two, three, four, five, and also perhaps within the zone uh, one itself. So you can either look at it from the perspective of the production where flows are being produced or from the perspective where flows arrive. So from the point of view of the attraction, the key element is clearly that we have this type of information. We need to know the total amount of flows in the entire system and ideally also at the level of the origins or at the level of the destination. Now, you wonder if you don't have this, then, well, here is the first type of technique that can be used in order to then actually find these total amount of trips. And one could be a very simple uh, linear multivariate regression analysis. So the regression analysis, it wants to make a link and it wants to explain the so-called dependent variable. The dependent variable here is T, the total number of trips. And then we look for variables that will explain the total amount of trips. So in that sense, the different X's here, they refer to variables that could have some bearing in trying to explain the total amount of trips. Well, if you think about it, it could be the number of people that live in a zone. It could be uh, the number of schools that we have. It could be the housing. There could be a lot of variables that we can use as a kind of a proxy to say something about uh, the total amount of uh, trips. So in a sense, you could say that the regression analysis could help us if we don't have a, an idea of the total amount of trips being made. There are a number of elements that uh, have an impact here and where we need to have a closer look at. So if we apply uh, a regression analysis, then this regression analysis also assumes that there are a number of assumptions, assumptions of normality, assumptions of not having any uh, heteroscedicity in the error terms, uh, a number of elements where there is a kind of a relationship between the 
the independent variables and the dependent variables, but also that there is not a much level of uh, autocorrelation, etc. So these are a number of assumptions that we need to first take into account. And if that is all okay, then clearly the, the key uh, element here that says something about how good the, uh, the independent variables are able to um, explain the dependent variable that is obviously measured by means of uh, the well-known uh, R square or adjusted R square. It tells you something like what is the amount of variance explained uh, by means of the uh, independent variables in relation to the dependent one. So here taken from uh, an example, the example here is the total number of car trips per household in 24 hours, so in one day. And then we say, well, we assume that maybe family size, the residential density, the total family income and the number of cars that might be the uh, independent variables that explain the total amount of car trips being made by this household. And then we estimate this and then we see what are the parameters. And if you look at this, well, first of all, you could have a bit of a discussion whether total family income and cars per household, whether they are not too much correlated with one another. Because if you have more income, maybe you also have more cars. So that needs to be checked first. But the most important here is if we look at the different coefficients, then these coefficients, they tell us something about that indeed there is a, a relationship between the, uh, the independent variable and the dependent one. And if you look at the, the, the four different estimated uh, parameters, then you see that the most important one, uh, almost equal to one, is X4, and X4 is the number of cars in a household. So if you have more cars in a household, then probably more car trips will be made by the household which is rather evident because if you have a car, you will probably use it. But if you look at, for instance, the residential density, then you see the more dense, the less you use a car. So that's also logic. So this negative sign here, although it's very close to zero, but the negative sign here also says something about the relationship between urban density and the use of, for instance, car trips by household. So that's an easy way, if you don't know the total amount of trips being made, that you then estimate this. And there are obviously a number of factors that will have an influence saying like, what are the number of potential trips that could be produced in a certain zone? So in the origin, but we then look maybe at household characteristics, the characteristics of the area itself, and also maybe the level of accessibility, higher levels of accessibility higher levels of accessibility, lower levels of accessibility, that will surely also determine the number of trips that are produced in a certain origin. We could also look at this from the point of view of the attraction, and then maybe job availability, uh, the use of space, and again, the levels of accessibility could be an, uh, an, an important or an, uh, an interesting element. Now, we obviously have this as a kind of a first step. And then the second step here is the distribution. So what does that mean? The distribution means that, well, if we know what are the total amount of trips being made, and we also know this maybe at the level of the origin, the different zones that we have in, in terms of our analysis, then the next step is to fill in the matrix. So here, all the numbers in red, these are the ones that we need to uh, try to uh, find out what are the flows within the different zones. So if we know that 50 people depart from one, then we need to know where do these people go to. They are, some of them staying within their own zone, but they're also going to other zones like 10 in zone two, five in zone three, et cetera. And there are different methods to do that. Um, there are simple methods, sometimes also referred to as so-called the growth factor method. And then you simply multiply everything relative to the, the total amount of growth that you expect in the total system. So which means that if I build an additional bridge, then probably there will be more flows. Uh, 
So maybe this figure goes from 215 to 230, and then you uh, just uh, equally increase all of the numbers here and all of the numbers there. Now that is obviously very simple. Uh, simple methods are okay, but if you want to do it a bit more correct, then a way forward is by means of a so-called spatial interaction model. So the spatial interaction model as being mentioned here, it has the origin and it has the destination. It is also being multiplied by a so-called impedance function. This is this function uh, Cij. It's the kind of the cost that it takes you either in euros or in time to go from one zone to the other. And then it also again relates to the total amount of trips that you make. The total amount of trips obviously within and between each different zone. Now, these spatial interaction models, they are um, well developed. Uh, they go back to uh, Wilson's uh, seminal paper and book in the 1970s. And you can say that if we look at the different types of models, then they're either constrained, they're not constrained, they're single constrained, or they're even double constrained. So the four different type of models that you have within step two that tells us something about the, um, the, the trip distribution. These are the ones that are mentioned here. And constraint means, in this sense, it's okay. It's, it's better to be constrained because constraint means that we know for sure what are the number of flows from one zone to the other. If we don't know that particular zone, then in that, or if we don't know the particular number, I should say, within the zone, then we see that it is uh, non-constrained. And maybe to just give you one example of how such a model works, suppose that we have three different zones, and here we see the impedance matrix within these three different zones. And clearly you can see if I move from zone one to zone one, then this costs me two euros, two minutes. So it costs me less effort than to go from zone one to zone two or from zone one to zone three. So in a sense, we already know that depending on the impedance matrix, then probably most of the flows, they will be intrazonal. They will be within their zone because that takes them the least effort. And probably where we see the fives here, that will be where the flow between zone three and zone two or vice versa between two and three there will be less interaction because the impedance matrix uh, in that sense uh, says that it takes me more effort to go from zone two to three or from three to one, to, from three to two, I should say. So a simple example, if we have a non-constrained model, then we don't know anything. The only thing we do know is the number of trips. Remember, this was the key element. So it's non-constrained, meaning that it's unknown. And therefore, we use a number of proxy variables. So we use, we use a number of proxy variables for the origin and also a number of proxy variables for the destination. So suppose that we know how many houses there are in the different zones. And we also know the number of jobs that there are in the different zones. These are then two proxies. Well, then maybe the number of houses tells me something about the number of households and the number of jobs tells me something about the number of workers. So ideally we would like to have the number of households and the number of workers. But in this particular case, we see that we don't have it. So we use a variable that we do have like number of houses, and number of jobs. So then simply bear with me. What do we do? Well, we fill in this model here. So we have K multiplied by the proxy of the origin multiplied by the proxy of the destination, and then obviously multiplied by this impedance function. So in that sense, if I go from one to one, it means what I do is I have 500 multiplied by 500, number of houses by, multi, by the number of uh, jobs, and then I also have to multiply it by one divided by four. Now, one divided by four, what does that mean? 
It's actually this impedance matrix. And we take the gravity model as designed by Newton uh, when talking about the attraction between um, uh, uh, entities in the in space, between, between stars and between planets. And then the uh, gravity model says that maybe it's best to just square the, uh, the impedance matrix. So one divided by the square of two, which is obviously four. If we then calculate all of this, what we see is we have the total number of almost 220,000 trips being made from zone one and two and three to all the others. So we have filled in the matrix, but we see that we have a large and too much uh, large number of uh, trips being made. In essence, we know that in the entire system, there are 2,000 trips being made. We now have about 20, and we have 220,000 trips. So this is where this factor K comes into play, and K is a scaling factor. So what we do is we rescale the matrix so that we have the total number of 2,000. So, and how we do this is simply we take 2,000 divided by this number, and then we have 0 0.0091. So all of the numbers here are then multiplied by this same scaling factor so that we have this as the end result. So what we did is we used two proxy variables, housing and jobs. We know that there were 2000 flows within that system. And this is the number of flows that we see between the three different zones. And remember, I said that maybe the intrazonal flow is the largest for the simple reason that the impedance function was just two, whereas the one where we see less flow is from three to two or from two to three. And we see about 44 trips and 51 trips of the total 2000 trips being made. Now, if we look at this, we can obviously redo this again, but then it's production constraint. So we know at the level of the production, we know the exact numbers. Then this is the figure, or this is the, the formula, or better the equation that we need to solve. So we then only use a proxy for the, uh, the, uh, the origin. Uh, in that sense, what we is now known are the number of households. But in this case, if we talk about shopping, then maybe we use floor area as a kind of a proxy for the shopping. And then we have this, we have to rescale it again, because now obviously it's not just one number, but it's at the level of uh, the, the different uh, origins that we have to fix this matrix. So we have three different scaling factors. And again, this is the end result. And even going quicker, attraction constraint is, and now what is known are the number of workers, what is not known is the number of households. So here you see the hashtags that resemble the figures that are known, the question marks, these are the ones that are unknown. We redo it again and again, and this is the result. And finally, what if, for instance, everything is constrained, that's, you could say, the ideal solution, because then we know the exact number of origins and the exact number of destinations. So that is all known, it's all fixed. So we need to fill in this matrix again, the households and the workers, if this is, for instance, in terms of commuting, they're all known. And then we have to redo this. And the, the only thing here to uh, watch out for is that we need to both at the levels of the rows as of the levels of the columns, we need to again fix these numbers to the set numbers that we know. And in order to do that, we do a kind of a, an iteration process. So we start with A's, and then we need B as is. Then we submit uh, the substitute to B's and do it again for the A's, et cetera, et cetera. And then in a certain, uh, after a certain number of iterations, you will see that the numbers will no longer change. And this is then the final result. So an easy way of applying a spatial interaction model that will have as an end result that we can fill in the matrix here uh, in terms of the, um, the number of trips being made. 
So step three, that's the modal split. And the modal split means that, well, we now look at this individual level here. So the number of trips from one to one is 10. And then we need to know, well, five apparently by car, three by bike and two by public transport. So if we then want to apply a method here, then the method that we're gonna use is a method which is often obviously referred to as multinomial logit model or a form, uh, a kind of a form of a logit model. If you only have two options to choose from, then this is a uh, binomial model. If it's just a selection between one mode and another, then it could be a kind of a logistic regression. But the point being that the dependent variable here is a categorical variable. So it's actually a label. And so the label is like car, bike, public transport. So if you have a categorical variable, what you cannot do is take an average of this. And if you cannot take an average, it means that you can also not apply a simple regression analysis because a regression analysis takes for granted, it assumes that you can take an average of your dependent variable. In this particular case, our dependent variables, well, they're obviously categories, they're labels, car, bike, public transport. We cannot take an average of this. What we can do is obviously calculate maybe frequencies, how many times certain people choose like car, bike, or public transport. So the method being used here, it's a method that is very common in transport modeling that's the application of a discrete choice model. So discrete choice models where, for instance, the multinomial logic model is the, the hobby horse. So that's the, let's say the approach most used. That is uh, the method that is being applied here. And then finally, we have the root assignment. And that means that, well, we know that out of the 10 people that go from zone one to zone one, five of them take a car. And then we need to know which route, which route are they going to choose? Three may be choosing the highway and two choosing the secondary road. So that means that we need to know why they choose three, these three, why they choose the highway and why the two others choose maybe this, a secondary road. And the way forward here is by means of what is then referred to as an assignment problem. And then in this assignment problem, you either can take into account stochastic effects, meaning that you assign in terms of maybe a, a kind of a distribution in terms of what are the number of cars or public transport or bikes that can be assigned to a certain route. And you can also take into account levels of congestion whether a route is already congested, yes or no. And depending on what combination you choose, you either assign in what we refer to if you do not take into account stochastic effects, and also if you do not take into account congestion, then we have a simple so-called all or nothing uh, uh, assignment. Um, in the other cases, you see what you have. Well, the example, what I gave here, and then let's say how it works. This is an area, you define the area in different zones. You then apply a regression analysis to find what are the total number of trips be made in the system. You then apply a gravity model. Then you look for a travel mode choice on the basis of multinomial logic or a discrete choice model type of approach. And finally, you assign it. And in that sense, the engineers could then say, well, if, for instance, you build a bridge, for instance, here you have a new bridge, then this will be the impact that we see on the system. For instance, in this case, we see more congestion. And here we see more congestion. The same holds true, for instance, if we take away a certain in infrastructure, then that will also have an impact, clearly. Now, as I said, these are very, in terms of uh, type of software that you now have uh, all integrated in one software package where all of this is easy to apply. And the main disadvantage of using this technique is that we use a lot of information, information at the individual 
at the spatial and at the temporal level. And that's clearly something that for transport researchers, that is something that we do not want to lose. We want to know who is actually traveling, the characteristics of the person. We know that has a huge bearing on trying to explain travel behavior, but also when uh, the temporal condition is important. And also clearly as geographers, we also want to not exclude and just reduce space to just distance. We want to have the spatial component uh, included there as well. So in a sense, if we aggregate what we use, uh, what we do is a kind of, um, we, and that's referred to as a so-called Simpson paradox, easily explained. If you look at, let's say these three or these four blue dots in isolation, and you see maybe this is the pattern that explains it. If we look at the red dots, then we see this is the pattern that explains it. But if we aggregate everything, so we have the eight dots in full, and maybe we see a totally reversed relationship between these different data points. So by aggregating stuff, we obviously lose information and that's something that we do not want. So this brings me to the second approach, which is the disaggregated approach. So data is not aggregated and it's the individual that is now the basic unit of the analysis. And in a sense, what we see is that first of all, we want to know whether a person wants to make a trip, yes or no. In a sense, this is trip generation. And then we want to know, well, what would be the choice of destination? So this is actually the second step, the trip distribution. By what means of transport, the modal split. What route do you take? The route choice. So the first four are just ideal, identical to the four, to the four, the four step model. What is being added here is obviously also the timing, the element of when will the travel be made. So the time is also being included here. And this can easily be illustrated by, again, a kind of an example here. Suppose that we want to um, have an analysis on what type of mode will people choose for a certain trip, car, bus or walking, we know what characterizes these different modes. And then it's a simple question of which alternative will you choose? And if we take as a given that we are dealing and choosing as economic men, so homo economicus, meaning rational people, then we will choose the alternative that gives us the highest utility. Now, if we have three different options, car, bus or walking, then it means that we will choose that option that will give us the highest utility. And we calculate, we can calculate the utility partly by what is referred to as the so-called deterministic or structural component, but there is also a stochastic component, a component that we do not know. So in a sense, what we can calculate, we will do. For instance, the car will cost us so much and so much time, and it gives us a higher or a lower level of comfort, so we can calculate this. So based on that, we can already have a bit of an assumption on what alternative will have the highest utility. But the point being that we also need to include a stochastic variable, and that stochastic component is just an error term. Error terms that we make in terms of the taste variation, random components, etc. So in a sense, the reasoning is very simple. We will choose J out of, and we will prefer J to M. So J and M are two alternatives. Note that we are adding the subscript I, I meaning an individual. So it's very individual specific. And in a sense, what we see is that if the, 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 the if we look at the, the difference between the random components, if these differences of the random components, if they are bigger than the differences in the structural components, in that sense, that individual, according to the theory, will choose for alternative J. Now, if we had more time, then I could illustrate this. And then obviously I would ask you for random numbers, and then we would see where you would end. And you would, uh, be surprised that the model is actually able to almost exactly predict how many people will choose alternative one versus alternative two. 
Uh, obviously, here we assume that the probability distributions explaining how the random components, how they are distributed, we assume them here to be uniformly distributed, meaning just a number between, in this case, minus two and plus two. Uh, or if both the random components, eh, and here we also assume that the random component for alternative two, that that is equal to zero, so that there are no errors being made. If we do include a random component for uh, alternative two as well, then in that sense, we see this is your choice space. So depending on a random number that you choose between minus three and three and minus two and two, maybe uh, after the lecture, you simply should do this and then ask for all the people who are participating to send these numbers. Then what we will see is that about 80% of the people who are listening, they will choose alternative one and about 20% of the people are, who are listening, they will choose alternative two. For the simple reason that if you look at what is the chance that I will be in this part of the space, um, choice space, well, that's about 80% and about 20%, that's the people who are, depending on a random choice of two numbers that will be located here. Now, if it was that simple, then we could just, um, I think in uh, the core spatial analysis, reduce it to maybe instead of 60 hours, reduce it to five hours. Unfortunately, it is not that simple because the error distributions uh, they are not uniform distributed, but they have different type of spatial distributions that can be applied. So if the random components, if they are identically and independently distributed from one another, and then depending on the type of model that you will choose, whether it's a normal distribution or a gumball distribution, then we will end up in either what we refer to as a logic model or a probit model. And the overall, uh, let's say, outcome of the, the random utility model of the discrete choice model, that's this formula here that you will find in almost any textbook on uh, transport modeling, where we can um, explain how individual I, when individual I will choose alternative J, well, that individual will do so if the exponent of the structural utility linked to that alternative is then divided by the sum of the exponent of the structural utilities of all the alternatives in the choice set. So you see here, the random component has disappeared. Why has it disappeared? Because we have assumed that it is Gumbel distributed, and then you can mathematically calculate this formula here as the end result. And that's obviously very, very useful for trying to predict which type of mode people will choose, which type of routes they will choose. Any discrete choice uh, problem can be solved using this uh, formula here, depending obviously on a number of assumptions again. Um, the second of the second approach is that we don't look at tours or trips but we're looking actually at activities of people. And that is the activity-based modeling approach. Because you could say a trip in and by itself has no utility on its own. And remember that I said that if we travel, then travel is being referred to as a disutility. So from that perspective, it means that we want to limit travel as much as possible. If you want to go on a holiday, then people will say, well, my holiday will start the moment when I arrive. So in that sense, arrive at your destination. So in that sense, from your home to the destination, it's a bit of a burden. And obviously, you would like to have that burden limited as much as possible. But we know that in order to participate in activities, people have to travel less in terms of COVID when everything was indeed being done on site uh, was being done online, I should say, and not on site, then in that sense, we know that there are rethinking of what is the derived uh, demand of travel and whether travel is indeed equally to a, a disutility. Now, in this activity-based modeling approach, what we do is we look at the trips that people make 
but the trips here being made are for purposes of, for instance, bringing a kid to school, then go to work, then do some shopping, go work, go back to work, then, well, probably here this person forgets to pick up the kid at school and because it goes directly to home, and then do some leisure and then again returns home. So on the basis of the activities being made, there we want to assume what are the type of trips that you have made. And you can imagine if you do this first trip one and two by car, then probably trip five is being done by car as well. So on the basis of the activities that people do, we also have and obtain additional information that is relevant for travel behavior research. Now this work is uh, again dating from uh, the 1950s by Shapin and even more so by obviously Hagerstrand with this well-known uh, space-time uh, geography where we add also the potential path area and we look at how people, what is the amount of time that they spend in a certain location, then they are moving and again they then arrive at a other destination that then could be their work or shopping or whatever. Um, in a sense, you could say that what Hegerstrand added to this theory is that we are also constrained that because we look at an individual approach where well, people need to sleep and eat, there are also coupling constraints and there are also authority constraints. And that also brings to the model that it becomes much more in the sense of trying to explain what is actually what is happening. And so we often take for granted that if we do a modeling, uh, a transport model approach that anything goes, but there are obviously quite a lot of constraints that also apply. And these three constraints here introduced by Hegerstrand are clearly constraints that have a high impact on the activity patterns. Now, um, to end, well, we are very much interested in trying to explain travel behavior, and that was the key. And you could say that by means of the either aggregated or the disaggregated flow, well, in a sense, you could say that, first of all, we have the travel behavior here, and that will, have, that will be influenced by a number of socioeconomic and demographic variables. That these, these variables, they will have an enormous bearing on trying to explain travel behavior. But we also have the built environment that will have an enormous impact on explaining travel behavior. And we also know in terms of travel behavior that car ownership is also a very important indicator. So you could say that the easy model is this one where you have just a number of variables that explain travel behavior that you could say is a kind of the basic conceptual model. But then we know also that there are quite a lot of mediating variables, meaning, well, the socioeconomic demographic variables, they have a direct impact on travel behavior, but also an indirect impact through car ownership. And the same holds true for the built environment. And one element which is clearly a very important topic in research is the so-called residential self-selection, that you self-select where you want to live, depending on what type of travel behavior that you would like. If you're very much a car lover, then probably you are not that worried if you live somewhere in a rural area where you're very much dependent, dependent on using the car for doing whatever travel you, you need to do. If you don't have a car living in a rural area, then you're very much dependent on public transport. Maybe then you want to live close to a railway station or a bus. And for instance, if you really are not fond of any type of motorized transport and you want to walk and cycle, then maybe you select to live in, an, in the city center in an urban area where everything that you want to participate in, that is simply you can uh, reach these destinations by means of just cycling or walking. So you see that the simple basic model turns into a much more complicated model. And then, especially uh, at Ghent, we have done quite some work on trying to maybe also add an, another important variable, and that's lifestyle. Lifestyle, which has an impact on not only stage of life, but also 
what type of psychology aspect that also plays a role in trying to explain travel behavior. And if we were to then add to lifestyle also health and well-being, then I think we have a very nice basket of uh, different variables that will explain our travel behavior analysis. Now, clearly, this type of model here, it would imply that you need to uh, have a more complex type of model. And the models that we are often using are so-called structural equation models. It's a kind of a combination of uh, different type of models, measurement model and explanation model added together. And that type of model um, is able to directly measure the impact of the, um, the variables, but also the indirect impact of variables through other variables. So to conclude, um, well, there are different methods and models. Regression analysis is one. And um, if you have count data, then we could also use Poisson regression. You have structural equation models that are potential models if also used with a lot of data uh, to supplement it with a factor and a cluster analysis. You have growth models or spatial interaction models that can help you in terms of uh, assigning different trips to different uh, areas that you want to do. And a wide range of discrete choice models that explains why people choose certain modes choose certain routes, uh, choose uh, certain companionship with who they want to travel, et cetera. And then a number of models that will also help you in assigning it to the infrastructure. So that's about it. I hope this was clear. And obviously, I'm happy to answer any question. I saw one element in the chat, but I could not check it yet. So happy to answer any question that you still might have. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Frank, for this um, great overview of the different sort of uh, models. And uh, I have one question before I uh, give the ability to, to ask the other ones, that uh, which sort of data you are using to, for, for the basis for these models and also that have you used or how you see that the, the new sort of like peak data is uh, possible to use this uh, traditional uh, transport models? Yeah, so thanks uh, for the question. Um, as I said in the beginning, and that could, that could be, let's say, a separate lecture on what type of data you could use in terms of uh, what it is that you want to analyze. I think if you go to the aggregate flow data, in that sense, big data, like for instance, mobile positioning data, that could be obviously uh, a possibility. But um, if we look at big data, then often for transport research, we miss out quite a lot of elements that is really, really crucial in understanding how travel behavior works. And for one, these are then again, referring to the Simpson paradox, meaning if we aggregate stuff, then we lose quite a lot of detail in terms of timing, individual characteristics of the person traveling, and also clearly on uh, the spatial aspect. So I think that big data has as its advantage that it gives us immediately uh, an information about the bigger picture, huh? big data, bigger picture. But if we really want to understand it, and I think if you look at what politicians want, they might want to have the big picture in the first place. But then again, they also want to have more focus on what you could refer to as the small data. And then small data in my mindset is still, well, using um, questionnaires. It could be online questionnaires or just the, the same pen and pencil, paper and pencil type of questionnaires. And we now also more and more see uh, that we have a kind of a mixed method type of approach. And this mixed method meaning that it's not only having like the big data that gives you the big picture, but then looking at maybe that what you want to analyze, looking at a, a really representative sample and um, the basis of internet or pen and paper, but then also on the basis of that type of information, you also want to have a bit more knowledge about what is really triggering people when they make decisions. And in that sense, the classical interviews is still a very, very, as a qualitative uh, type of data collection, still very, very uh, important uh, to look at.
Well, I, I wrote a small editorial, I think a couple of um, years ago for transport reviews on the so-called uh, beyond the data smog. I refer to by a book by David Schenk, um, which is an, um, uh, a journalist that also thought about what is the impact of this enormous amount of data that we see uh, arising every day as we speak thousands and ten thousands of data are being produced every every nanosecond so what can we really really do with this and i think there the, the key question should be that well given the bigger picture that might be interesting but then again if you really want to look at what is happening if you really want to understand why people make certain decisions then clearly qualitative data and also the traditional um, uh, questionnaire as, as, as i said is also something relevant remember we have aggregated modeling approaches for aggregated data, but we also have disaggregated modeling approaches for disaggregated data, for people, uh, for data at the level of an individual, a household, or what we now also quite often refer and want to understand is how families, for instance, make decisions. So that's also an interesting uh, new step forward um, uh, as a kind of a data analysis process. Thank you for this uh, detailed answer. <laughs> now I give the uh, possibility to ask for students to have some questions to Frank. No? No. You have? I have one if nobody else. Okay, you can ask. I turn on my video so that Frank can see me here, or that doesn't work. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, Hi, Frank, it's, it's Carl. We met a couple of weeks ago. I'm, uh, I'm sitting in the room. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, for fun, I, I thought I would ask you a, a question. Uh, it's kind of a, a good or evil sort of question. Um, the people that maybe I would consider myself uh, allies with, you know, people that are in the, in the business or the game of trying to promote active and sustainable transport, I think we're, we're kind of used to the idea that, that these models will be used for things like uh, supporting this, this old fashioned predict and provide kind of approach that somebody shows up and says, well, this is uh, the pace of residential development and this is how, what's happening in terms of uh, growth of uh, employment in the city. And so you can anticipate demand for traffic increasing by X and X amount, so you need to widen these roads. Um, but obviously, you can you you could use these models the other way around. You could start from the position that uh, we we want to change the modal share by such and such a percent. Uh, what are going to be what are going to the changes? Um, what, what will the changes uh, needed be? In terms of you know all these other boxes that you have in your, in your diagrams, I just thought it'd be fun to ask you to, to talk about the possibilities that way. That, you know these models uh, supporting the good as opposed to the, <laughs> as opposed to the evil. Um, just in you know general ways, how, how how is this? Like I'm not really familiar with how this is being used already or how it might be used. Uh, just that kind of you know example I'd be interested in. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Carl. Um, again, interesting question. I I like uh, to think about uh, evil or wicked, wicked questions or problems, and especially the one that you asked is uh, maybe indeed a bit of a wicked problem in a sense to solve. And as I said, that in the 1960s, the engineers were called upon to uh, to to explain what should be done. Should we build the bridge? Yes or no? almost in the mindset of the politician, it was, we are going to build this bridge because that will lead to more growth, it will lead to more employment, etc. So come up with a method that then will tell us that how beneficial this is. I also said that uh, you could also take this uh, four step model, you could also just use it by taking away infrastructure and by just saying that what would happen if, for instance, this road goes from a four lane to a two lane? happen if, for instance, we install bike lanes and we take away a uh, lane for the cars? What with, for instance, um, dedicated public transport on a certain route? 
So in that sense, you could also have uh, the model applied. And what you then probably expect is that maybe there is not a growth in the total amount of trips being made, but maybe a change depending on what mode is being uh, promoted. And maybe if you use it like free public transport or you install a kind of a bike sharing system, um, then in that sense, you really want to steer the people in that direction. So in a sense, um, I think we should not only think in terms of growth scenarios, but also in terms of decline scenarios and maybe also in maybe in shifting type of scenarios. And uh, you have this, uh, this famous paradigm, paradigm in terms of uh, we, we want to either avoid it or we want to either then shift it to uh, a different mode. So here the models as well could play a role at an aggregated level. It would have an impact on, let's say, what would happen if we change, for instance, uh, make public transport more attractive by, by offering it at a low rate or a fair rate equal to zero. What would have what would be the impact of this on the system that that could easily be uh, easily could be measured one thing that i did not talk about and it's also a in very interesting part is obviously we can also work with simulations and uh, the classical approach here would be to have like an agent-based model that you could uh, set up um, where the agents are then, uh, moving as a kind of a synthetic population and you have let's say uh, a cross section of uh, the population in a certain city. And then you give these agents uh, different types of rules by which they need to optimize their behavior. And you can make changes to the network, you can make changes to the agents, you can make changes to the modal choices they have, you can make changes to the routes they can choose from. So you can have a lot of, let's say, simulation type of um, uh, elements that in the end you will have some kind of a, a measure or an objective function and that could be um, trying to maybe uh, maximize the utility overall and that you then look at what is the impact of this. So it's not only that uh, the, the methods are used now uh, for reasons to have uh, higher levels of transport, at least obviously if we are thinking about making changes to the network and also clearly influencing the behavior of the actors or of the people, and we know there are quite a lot of instruments to do so, then these, uh, clearly these methods, the ones that I explained, they will also either at the aggregated level or at the more disaggregated individual level, they will uh, give you more information on that particular issue. So that's an, a really interesting way forward as well where indeed, instead of just, uh, as you say, uh, predict and provide, then you go to a kind of a simulation process and then you want to really see what is happening within the system uh, by making changes uh, to the network of the agents uh, as, a, as a way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have one uh, question in the chat from Merki Salover. And this is so. Should we do more better modeling uh, of current situation to understand on how we live or do more better model simulations to understand on how we could improve our life? Yep, uh, interesting one. I, I think um, if Usually, uh, from a policy point of view, they, they would like to have a kind of a, a zero measurement level. So, and that is often then referred to as um, the business as usual. And then we uh, put forward a number of scenarios and see what, what happens there. And um, I think in order to understand the future, uh, or at least to try to predict the future, we really need to understand the present. And not only the present, but also what happened in the past. So instead of forecasting, backcasting is usually a very good method to see how good your model actually works. And that's sometimes surprising where you see um, people doing forecasting using all kinds of uh, very complicated measures. And then they say, well, for the next 10 years, we see a growth scenario of 5% yearly. But if you then apply the same approach to backcast, then you would say, 
enormous under or an overestimation of what happened in the past. And then that type of data, if you have it as a kind of a comparison, then you know that probably there is something a bit wrong with the, uh, the parameter estimation of the, of the model. So I think in this sense, all three past, present and future will have a, an, an interesting uh, way forward. In my view, I think understanding what is happening now and um, clearly in terms of transport, if you want to make changes, we know that the behavior of people, that also takes uh, some time for people to change. Huh? So that will also have an impact. So therefore we were in Flanders, we were very unhappy when our 10 yearly census uh, was uh, no longer being put in place because that at least gave us data for every 10 years to see what happened. And you could say that 10 years is maybe long, but in terms of, let's say, a generation, okay, it's just too short, but at least you have some reference of what has happened in the, in the past. So I would be very interested to see whether if we are indeed able with the models we have, whether we can predict what we see now, look, up, look whether this has some bearing if we were to backcast it, and then in that sense, can we explain what happened in the past? And if these two are already more or less uh, correct, then it gives you, I think, a higher degree of freedom of saying what will probably happen in the future. Then again, we absolutely uh, are unable to predict it. And uh, we see what is happening now in certain, in certain parts of the world that surely will have also an, an enormous bearing impact on, um, on not only our personal travel behavior, but also on the, the, the transport of freight. That is something that we cannot predict. As a result, no single model can ever have this in, um, in, its, uh, in its initial setting. So it's still a bit of give and take. And therefore, I think it's very important to always look at the face validity of the model to see that indeed the estimated parameters, if, if they are already going in the, in the right direction, that I think is, uh, is already an, an important indication of how well you are doing with them, what it is that you want to explain. Thank you, Frank. And now, as the time is running very fast, I give the last question to, to Aga. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Frank, for, for this very good uh, lecture on different transport modeling, modeling approaches, uh, really useful, and, and especially for our uh, students. And uh, just as a continuation to the question by Carl, I also wanted to like discuss with you, maybe not even so much to ask, but rather discuss. So, so, so how much these transport modeling approaches or, or practices are used currently uh, to induce change in the context of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the, uh, the European Green Deal? We have um, uh, policies in terms of health, equity, uh, biodiversity and climate, uh, we want to give uh, access to different social spatial groups, to destinations as well as travel groups. So how much these uh, modeling approaches are used to change the infrastructure, mode uh, provision uh, or the transport serv service as such, when thinking also that the homo economicus that you talked about, uh, talking about the utility. So for people uh, currently, the utility might not only be the cost uh, of in time or cost in euros, but also a cost uh, in burned calories or the, the cost for health or the, the, the good for climate, for example, what you might do. So, so what is the practice? Do you see a change there? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's one way of um, having more psychological and more health and well-being type of variables, you could say subjective variables that will have uh, a large part of the explanatory power of what it is that you see that you want to explain. So we're often may maybe too much focusing on just the objective factors of cost and time. Although if we look at models and we want to use them and explain that we see that in, in a large number of cases, costs and time are still highly, highly relevant and they're almost responsible for let's say 60, 70% of maybe the variation that we need to explain is captured within these two. Now, in a sense, if we know that these are the two most important factors in terms of the objective uh, variables, you could say like 
well, why bother with the 30, 40% that we don't explain if we want to have it like uh, almost roughly correct. Now, I think here um, we need to also pay attention to these subjective variables. And the subjectivity, that's, let's say, the key element that was brought in by the behavioral uh, economists and uh, uh, people like Alan Pritt and others who looked at the level of information that people have and also their capacity to use that information, but also looking at the factors like you said, so uh, the aspects of well-being, things that you cannot um, measure in and by itself and that you need to ask people it indirectly or directly by means of uh, semantic scaling or whatever to have a bit of an information on how they how do they feel aspects of equity and i think it's really really relevant it's a it's a, it's a very hot topic at the moment but also uh, the elements of of health and in that sense i think the most of them if not all of the models they are they are capable of uh, of dealing with these type of variables the problem probably being is that you also need to uh, obtain the, the right data for this. And that, that would probably mean that you have to put in more effort uh, instead of just looking at the objective elements, also to, to have a bit more uh, insight into the subjective factors that play a role in, in decision making. Because we all know maybe in the end, it's a kind of a cost and time effect, but somehow there is also elements that play at a more subjective level and that you also want to include into um, trying to explain the travel behavior of people. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for this uh, lecture and also the discussion. And now, uh, the next week, we have two lectures. On Tuesday, April 19, we have Associate Professor Hans Oru from University of Tartu with the lecture, What are the health implications on mobility choice? And the lecture is in Estonian. And the second lecture is on Thursday, April 21. And the lecture is at 8 o'clock, not the usual time that we have had previously uh, in, in Estonian time. And, uh, and then gives the lecture Professor Anthony Elliott from the University of South, South Australia. And the title of the lecture is uh, No One Driving Technologies, Systems, Retrotopias. See you soon.